this is the sort of the the topic that we have today, which is kind of on um, the limits of adaptation. And I suppose that idea uh, for this um, reading room is kind of that energy demand is sort of on the move, varying, changing and evolving. And that um, the organisations in particular, so I suppose thinking about, a bit about organisations today, have to kind of adapt and respond to different events with implications for energy demand. And, um, you know, they're, they're evolving anyway, to, uh, sorry, adapting and responding anyway, not necessarily to some of the issues that we've, we're interested in in the flexibility and in creds about adapting to a more uh, connecting with a more intermittent energy supply system, but evolving and adapting on their own. And that some of these adaptations that, I mean, in light of maybe things that happen in this year, but of course, all, all other kinds of adaptations and responses to uh, whatever challenges certain organisations are facing, that those adaptations and the limits of those adaptations give us a sense or provide us some kind of like insight into the making of core definitions of core service and of baselines as well. I suppose that this session or the idea of this session and the, some of the input that we've got for this session is to think about um, what do different organisations and maybe companies or businesses take to be the limits of, of adaptation or how are those limits made? How are those core services made? Um, how what how can we see the kind of non-negotiable practices and limits that are implicit in contingency plans but also in we've been thinking about um everyday forms of managing demand of buffering and storage and also everyday ways of handling disruptions so the kind of three inputs or people who are going to say a few words about this today and thanks very much were um greg uh Marsden was going to talk to us a little bit about uh, contingency, resilience and transport, possibly something on COVID, Greg. And Debbie um, won't be able to make it until uh, half past 12, but I think she's also here to say something on her work on trucking and um, uh, kind of like buffering and logistics and trucking. And I've been trying to think a little bit about storage um, and hospitals and what these uh, I guess some of these things say about these limits of adaptation. Right, so um, Stan asked me to put some thoughts together. Um, we've been doing work on uh, trying to understand behavioural responses to uh, disruptions um, probably for the last decade. Uh, that's included like flooding, snow and ice, closure of bridges and more recently uh, COVID-19. So um, I'll give a, a little bit of thought to some of the frameworks that we've used and some of the concepts and then illustrate it with one or two uh, examples. I think I've got eight slides, Stan, so I won't go on forever. So um, contingency is not a word that we used in our projects, but um, it obviously relates to what we've been thinking about. So um, I pulled out uh, just a dictionary definition there, provision for a possible event or, or circumstance. Um, but that made me think about um, a provision to enable what so what kinds of um, contingency that supports what kind of outcomes and you know and maybe we all have different uh, parts of the system that we think about uh, and therefore you know might be thinking about enabling different sorts of things um, but one thing that's been a particularly useful guide for us in the work that we've done was the book by Henrik Vollmer and he argues that in, in moments of disruption, what, what gets disrupted is this coordination of activities and expectations within a collective entity. And obviously, from my point of view, from a transport point of view, even though he doesn't write anything really about uh, transport, that, you know, it's social participation and how that gets reconfigured that we're, that we're really talking about. But I think the thing that's really interesting is this notion of expectations which I'll come back to. So at what scale do you think about contingency? So you mentioned organisations, Stan, in your, in your introduction. I think you can think about contingency at all sorts of different scales. So systems of provision, 
you know how how long does food store how much of it's frozen stored manufacturing how much inventory do we keep in warehouses uh, in order to enable us to do things the image on the right is um the queues that were caused in i think it was 2012 when there was a there, w there wasn't even a tanker driver strike there was a talk of the threat of a tanker driver strike and the um Francis Mordo is the one of the ministers at the time suggested people fill up a jerry can of of petrol I mean even though it's an illegal and a stupid idea to have 20 litres of petrol in your house but actually what that revealed is that we just how uh, our assumptions about how much petrol needed to be in the the filling stations and how we didn't know anything about how much petrol people stored in their in their vehicles more generally that it doesn't take much for for the system to run out of of fuel on the basis of a set of essentially a set of expectations about how much contingency you need in a fuel supply system. You can look at it at an organisational scale. So what contingencies do, does Network Rail put into its timetable, for example, to allow for for weather effects for late running of trains? How does that all work? Um, more recently, uh, communities uh, where groups get got together during COVID and kind of shared contact details. If you're self-isolating, I'll do your shopping or walk your dog or, you know, so you you can look at a contingency at that scale. And then, you know, further down, you can look at the household partner drawing on family or, or friends and so on. But I don't think any of those lenses on their own make sense. They're, they're all connected. What you can do as a household also relates directly to the systems of provision or the organisations um that you're that you're engaged with so it's actually a multi-scalar thing uh, contingency you can just focus your your attention on one part of the system more than more than another for example and i would argue that you can't actually measure contingency so it's quite an interesting concept to to think about and graham and thrift's work um points to the fact that you know actually it's only when things break that you see the importance of the everyday and that in kind of re remaking and redoing the things that we need to do during these periods you get um, innovations and people putting things together in new combinations to allow them to do things what we've generally found is that actually people's response set is more or less there like they do it sometimes they might do it for completely if you're looking at a household level that their, their behaviors might be done for completely different reasons so they may occasionally have work from home or occasionally they might get a taxi to town um it, you know because you know the car's broken down or or whatever it is so that they're kind of um the set of actions that are available to them at any one point in time generally they they've used them for some purpose or other uh these new circumstances force them to think about different ways of putting those potential uh, options together but really importantly it's the expectations that exist for for example the firms that they work for or the delivery systems that they're engaged with, which really uh, the, the change in those expectations are the things which really open up more substantial opportunities for adaptation. So my first example there is COVID-19. So if you wanted, this, this is a chart from some research we're doing, which looks at frequency of working at home before and during lockdown in 10 different parts of the UK. So this was um, done in June. So you can see that the, the green bars of people who worked home five five days a week or or more. And I don't think you could have asked, well, if you had asked individuals about how much they could work from home, they wouldn't have been able to tell you it was that much because it depended entirely on their companies. If you'd approached the companies and said, how much are you willing to let your people work from home? They would not have told you it was that much, but the circumstances required that all sorts of roles that previously had been thought to never be workable from home were suddenly mandated to be worked from home. And so the whole system had a whole lot more contingency in it than you than you would have been able to find out by by engaging with people in the system. Now, equally, it's interesting to look at the, the lines on the right hand side of the chart, which uh, my job could could not be carried out from home and they don't shift all that much at all. So in this particular system of employment, there's some areas which have got no contingency at all you know from, from from that perspective so i think that's quite an interesting example to to think through the second example is one from childcare. so again thinking about what sorts of 
activities people feel that they can trade off this was interesting childcare is something that that um you can't not do or not find a way of having done you know even if you're not doing it yourself so we found in the the work we did around flooding in 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 york where um this particular well it's actually my local primary school closed massive amount of trading of favors between families so again that's something that happens anyway but you know it's very intensive during this kind of time period invoking occasional paid childcare, uh, rearranging working practices between partners but again that depends a bit on what you do so self-employed people said well you know this is a real problem for me every day i'm not every day i'm having to do that i'm not earning so you know i feel like i've got fewer options available to me key workers who, ne who need to get in to uh, be in the hospital or, or, or whatever um, and then where your you know where your family where your networks are located so I think it's just an interesting reflection on when you drill down what range of factors become important for particular cases we came up with um, a list of what is it seven different adaptations that related to activities and travel you know we, we spend a lot of time in transport talking about changing mode so remoding rerouting these are things which people do uh, quite regularly retiming as in within a point in a day do you set off a bit earlier or later we found a lot more adaptation in rescheduling so a lot more activities could be moved within a month or within a week than necessarily could be easily retimed but then there's a limit to that because well if you need to do that activity then you know you need to do it at some point so how helpful is rescheduling from a from a carbon point of view for example um relocating gets done quite a lot shopping elsewhere for example something people do uh, seeking leisure uh, opportunities elsewhere i think we've seen a lot of that in um covid reallocating um between members of the household or other community members and then reducing not not doing not doing those activities uh at all so um final slide some questions i think it's helpful to think about um what sorts of things what systems or activities have less contingency and i think the more mutual coordination there is involved in in the activities the less contingency there is sports you know a game of sport an organized game of sports quite difficult to you can shift it in time but you know the actors are the need to be involved and there's a lot of coordination there um we found that infrequent sometimes these get talked about as like well they're, they're uh, optional things things that don't happen very often leisure activities but things like weddings actually really important to people but not things that people want to uh, exhibit any flexibility around uh, some things are perishable so if you're not there at the point in time when it happens, then you're not there at all. And then there are some activities. So people are much more willing to give up a commute because they do it all the time and they can catch up their their work or that, you know, that they're, they're used to doing that differently. But things like caring, not going to visit your sick relatives or, you know, that that is something which um, people find more difficult. So, you know, you can think about what systems or what activities has less less contingency and which therefore which things might have more um things with spatial options in in transport um things which you can move uh in time um you could hold more stock uh, we choose not to because we you know the, the economic system has decided that we can we can save money by doing things just in time but that's a contingency it's a decision on contingency as to how much headroom you've got for for things to to go wrong or to be different to your anticipation and then another question where are infrastructures in thinking about contingency here um, and i think that the way i would think about it is probably that they they helped an affordance of the expectations about what's possible and where and when and how and how much we do things and if you had a different uh, infrastructure system it would have some different affordances in terms of its contingency so that's my uh, initial set of thoughts thank you um i think it's probably useful to 
go to do the sort of like three inputs because one of the the interesting thing is to like cut what will be interesting is to kind of cut across them okay so i guess it picks it actually picks up a little bit on um some of the things that greg was saying and especially at the end there um a little bit about uh stock and just in time and headroom some of these issues as a way of connecting to contingency and the limits of adaptation storage is kind of uh, or sometimes seen when it comes to i suppose energy demand and flexibility is kind of seen as a solution for or a, dem a, a demand side management solution you know ha just have enough storage um and then you know you can kind of cancel out some of the uh, issues about intermittent um supply and the timing of supply and and demand uh, in the paper that we wrote uh, elizabeth and i wrote with Peter on conceptualizing flexibility, we sort of um, raised, I guess, a few uh, questions or issues about storage, where we said that, you know, actually judgments about um, the need for storage usually take the extent of demand where and when it happens as red or holds a kind of notion of need for particular kinds of services stable. So I think that's something um, important that we raised about storage when it comes to energy demand and also the judgments about capacity and storage um, that are made in the past matter for judgments about needs in the present, about how they might be met in the present as well. So there's a kind of like historical element to that, to the storage. So I guess thinking about storage as a sort of solution you know just having enough headroom or something like that is to kind of fix to know how much headroom you need how much storage you need is to fix demand or uh you know to fix the kind of the services that are being met by that by that capacity um to treat those as fixed and not moving or a or a shifting part of the equation so that sort of got me thinking a little bit, I suppose, more in, in general about the relationship between storage and adaptation or storage and changing services and practices. And I decided to go back to, if some of you know that I did a project on um, hospitals and the timing of working practices in and connected working practices in hospitals as they matter for energy, energy demand. So I went back to an interview that I thought was quite interesting to try to see something about this relationship between storage and adaptation. So this is an interview with Doug, who was the director for procurement, at a, a quite a big or an associate director for procurement, at a very big hospital that I w uh, was doing interviews at, basically. And sorry, I know this isn't great, but I'm basically going to dig through his interview to sort of tell a story about storage and adaptation. So you don't need to read it all, but I've just put it up there to sort of remind me and you can see it. So Doug sort of, when we started the interview, he told me he's, you know, I guess this is sort of setting the scene that, I mean, remember the NHS is something like the fifth biggest organization in the world after the US Army and McDonald's and Walmart or something. And it's a, you know, big contributor to climate change and they have so much, you know, stock and stuff moving through the organization and coming in. So he talked, but he talked about how they have um, seven days worth of stock that they rotate, bringing in a lorry every night. This is for consumables, so everything from gloves to toilet rolls to bandages and and all the rest. I guess that seven day cycle is linked into a or that seven day stock rotation and uh, stock system and the headroom is linked into a couple of things, including when the supply chain picks. So during the daytime to get it out and delivered at night so that it can be stored or where well, they put it out in the hospital in the morning, but also the zones in the hospital. So each zone in the hospital has its day when it gets its delivery. So the hospital kind of zones and then each zone can hold its consumables for a week or something like that. And that's for consumables. But he also talked to me about kind of high value stock as well. So in particular, raised kind of orthopedic things. And he had this move that he liked to do when before the interview and we were walking through the stock rooms sort of things, or it was actually round, they, they keep these in, yeah, in the back of a, you know, round the corner from the operating theater, basically. 
Um, and, it, you know, he sort of points to some boxes on the thing and there's, you know, loads of these boxes on the shelf sort of thing. And he says, oh, you know, uh, you think it's all right, isn't it? Just having these up here. And he says, what if I told you each one of those boxes like this is worth, you know, uh, a Volkswagen Polo? He's like, you know, that's how much it is up there just kept up on these shelves in this room. He thought that was really important. But the the thing that he raised or came up in the interview was that there's so much for every kind of item. So one of these orthopedic items, uh, you know, I guess their knees and hips and things like that, that um, you always need uh, so many backups in case anything goes wrong, but you also need, he calls it a distribution curve. So different sizes and outliers of sizes, but then there's also different types and preferences by different clinicians as well. So these, this has a different kind of su uh, supply chain and a different kind of timing and replenishment cycle, which isn't on the weekly like the consumables, but a 48 hour cycle. Uh, another thing that he raised, or another important thing that he raised in this interview, I suppose that was sort of striking and quite interesting, was that the con both the consumables and the high value items run at quite steady annual cycles of demand that you can see in, I guess, in the in the procurement profiles of the, well, on, on the consumables, for example. So he talks about that demand drops away in July and August. There's not as much happening in the hospital because the clinicians are, a lot of the clinicians are going on holiday. So the clinics kind of like slow down, um, don't need as much stuff. And he says that he's been there for 10 years and it repeats itself every year. So it's not a blip. This is the the, the cycle picks up again in October to December and then and then builds up again until July and August and drops off. He says that that's consistent in everything. If it, and he's he said if it's consistent in consumables and you can see it in cash expenditure, et cetera, you can see it in everything else. And he would expect it to be an energy bet anyway. So I suppose the things I'm raising here are that there's different cycles with things like consumables uh, and high value items and that, that they seem to be fairly repetitive, at least, or that they have a rhythm to them um, or that that's how they're perceived by the organization and by Doug. So Doug wants to make the or in the interview, he's really excited because he wants to become the seventh or something like that hospital that's going to you know, streamline and manage demand, manage the stock much more efficiently by basically having a, a super data set, putting tags on everything and scanning everything. Um, we call this this RFID system, which is to try to get to a bit like Greg was saying, a kind of just in almost a just in time system. And the reasons for that are then there would be less time storing and stocking. Yeah, you know, less less time for uh, clinicians and nursing and care staff trying to find items or order items, I think everything's kind of on demand. And then they, they, you know, he talks about all the other benefits that this has about, you know, if you zap the patient, zap the clinicians, zap the assets, zap the products, zap the place, you've got a total picture of who carried it out. You know what training they've done. I mean, it's very Orwellian. You know what training they've done, you know uh, who it was, um, you know, which products are the most effective for which outcomes and the most appropriate products. So you get a whole new visibility, he says, that's never been there before. And more importantly, what they perceive this will do is allow them to look at blocks of efficiency, those products, and then move blocks of activity to more appropriate footpaths, basically making the, they, they think, kind of making the hospital more efficient. So one way to deal with the demand is get a full, and he talked about as well how, you know, he's employing less and less, if you like, uh, stock warehouse managers, if you like, on the floor, and more data analysts. And that's the, where they were hoping to move to, more data analysts to predict, to understand the pictures and move on. He, the other issue that he raised was about convincing clinicians. Clinicians have a particular you know, thing they want to work with. They have a preference for this orthopedic thing, this kind of scalpel, this kind of whatever. And he sees the role of procurement and the stock systems as being, you know, more than just managing the stock for the clinicians, but actually influencing how to make the most efficient and effective mm, hospital, actually. So part of the scanning, uh, the scanning and the RFID is called scan for safety. 
is about being able to give some evidence to say to you know surgeon whoever actually you know these products have the best outcomes you you know other people use this and they can evidence that and convince clinicians to to kind of join in so those are the two things that he was uh, that he was kind of focused on and pushing in the interview but what I thought was quite interesting three things that came up in the interview as well were that those what he's trying to do in making that system itself within the hospital as a kind of like efficient as possible as streamlined as possible just in time limit you know moving that capacity down basically what's quite interesting is that there are several things that are kind of like connected outside of the hospital or connected beyond uh, the organization of what he's trying to do so one is one really good example when they get to christmas and they've got you know several bank holidays to deal with what's really important is that they have those you know even though he wants to move to the data analysts and things is that they have those people in place the stock managers the material managers who know the trends know the what's fast and what's slow moving and that they double up the order so, but they you know they don't have too much that they can't hold it all on the or they you know clog up the system if you like but they don't have too little to not get them through the christmas period i suppose what was uh, interesting is that even though they kind of have that on site that sort of timing and they can double up that order is that actually the storage that's more important if you like is the storage for the NHS supply chain, which actually closes for two weeks. So he has here at the end of this quote, of course, what we don't realize is that while the NHS might close its back office or you know, the hospitals, I think he means they might close that back office for a couple of days. Of course, clinical things are still, still happening. The, the manufacturers, distributors and the NHS supply chain are actually closed for two weeks over Christmas. In a way, it's kind of not about on site having you know managing too much or too little it's also about trying to accommodate two weeks of closures so storing if you like kind of goes further up the line and you can see that as well in the you know carrying on talking about Christmas is that it's not just that storing kind of like goes up the line with the you know having more storage at the NHS uh, sorry at the supply chain but actually the tempo of that so even if you want a just in time scan everything coming on demand that's fine within the hospital and fine for the supply chain but of course uh you know as he points to here that actually the stuff that's coming in for christmas is actually being made in january and february and shipped in august so he has this nice, in the second half of this quote, he has this um, nice thing where he says, we're really responsive. We're having conversations all the time about what's coming up, what we're doing, how reactive we can be, planning, shutting beds, closing beds, opening, and what this matters for what we need to, to order. But then he also sort of recognizes that, but of course, it's not an instant supply. We can't turn it on and off because we have to make those orders six months, you know, nine months in, in, in advance. And then the last thing I suppose that I found that I sort of thought was quite interesting about this interview with Doug is that maybe a bit ambitiously for him, but it was really in interesting that he recognised that if you like this, you know, the stock system, the kind of things that they're using in items, inventory, medicines, what have you matters for the services that are happening in the hospital matters for recovery matters for discharge and so as they can the the procurement team if you like the stock management team actually um see themselves yet yeah, a bit ambitiously see themselves as actually being able to shape the services of the hospital and maybe even outside of the hospital so he's saying we could actually use procurement invest in procurement to give benefits actually out into the community, maybe even shaping uh, the flow of demand itself. So he says, we're not quite there yet, but there's this kind of, there is this idea, he says at the bottom, a holistic approach to technology and demand to, to connect the, the services in the, in the hospital that's underlined by this stock system, if you like. So just a final couple of 
thoughts. I remember Dale came to visit us in the demand center a few years ago. Um, and he was writing and this paper, which is published now with Joe Mylan, which was about, I suppose, kind of about laundry. But the idea that I really took away from it was that the laundry basket or all other areas in the house, ironing piles and wardrobes um, become kind of like barometers for the flow of activities in the house, supporting all kinds of, you know, all kinds of activities, the school uniform and the gym kit and the Sunday best and all the rest. The washing basket becomes a kind of barometer and gives a sense, you know, the storage of the washing basket gives a sense of, you know, the activities that are, that are happening. And so I suppose in some ways the kind of the storage system in the hospital also gives a kind of, is a barometer of uh, the activities in the hospital, um, but it's also a kind of like performative one or it's interconnected as well. Yet yeah, moving to this kind of just in time logic, um, a standardization and this efficiency to manage demand, I think there's interesting questions to ask, you know, just in, just in time, just enough for what, enough just in time for what, based on what, and moving to, to that kind of a logic and a streamlined uh, stock system or something, what's the effect of that? What's the feedback of that across the organization of those services? And, you know, this example shows that, of course, that uh, the ad the possibility for adapting that system is connected and interconnected back across these supply chains. So I suppose what it left me thinking was that storage is a metaphor in some ways. This these kinds of interconnections, the feedback, and the storage as a interconnected barometer is kind of a metaphor for energy demand. But I suppose more interestingly, this story about hospitals and uh, storage, the use of consumables, how this shapes services. Actually, this is intertwined and connected with a story about energy demand as well. Jacopo, you are the first person on my screen if I'm going to have a system. No, thanks. Thank you both. Uh, it made me think uh, quite a lot. Um, I, uh, I'll start from I just want to make a point on what Greg said about uh, uh, contingency and how it cannot be measured. And, uh, and I think, you know, uh, I think what we learned from, uh, from these, um, you know, two presentations is that contingency, like storage, is about, uh, is often about adding stuff. Um, and uh, um, storage in energy system is, about physical boxes which are a bit everywhere and have um, a cost so it's kind of an addition to the infrastructure which we um which uh, with, without storage let's say and to me the the kind of smart digital logistics of just in time is about reducing those margins of contingency so to Kind of towards an optimization uh, or, or 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 efficiency uh, model, um, and so I think those two forces are in play, and in a sense they are also in the measurement of of contingency. So I think in the examples there are things like additional uh, volumes, like liters of petrol um, during a, a, an expected strike. The uh, the example of the barometers for the washing basket is one that. Um, is is obviously great. Um, there are also other things like the space for uh, parking for lorries in case of a no deal uh, Brexit, um, and the additional time also in uh, you know like the one day of supplies for hospitals during Christmas is another great example. I think those are all additions or contingency, as in adding to uh, the space, the time, the volumes um, uh, of uh, of what is normal. Um, and so, I mean, so I mean, obviously, as as an economist, we always think of look, looking at what can we measure rather than not. And I think those are placeholders in my head for uh, towards measuring contingency. That's it. Yeah. Can contingency be measured? Question mark. Um, Dale, you're uh, next on my screen. If you're, if that's okay. Thanks. Thanks, both Greg and and uh, Stan for your your talks. I mean, obviously, I'm going to go straight to laundry baskets because why not? I mean, I think what, one of the things about the basket as barometer type 
argument. So I have some drilling going on. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, is that you know we, we Unilever picked up on it and set up, did um you know they they sort of brought into the whole concept that you need to not focus so much on you know to focus on storage. Where's the stuff stored and and how can that be shifted? And so they came up with a load of things which may be a bit gimmicky and so on, but it, it did work. So they invented things which were you know different kinds of fabric freshener things and ways of arranging laundry storage and their data which I don't know anything about how robust it is did did significantly reduce the number of laundry the amount of time and labor and, which was a key thing for them and the number of washing loads in a household so that you know focusing and shifting on storage rather than washing machines and fab, uh, textiles in the way that they normally did did make a difference one of the things that sort of came up in my head and it sort of also links into Greg's talk as well is partly just because I mean a couple of weeks ago Elizabeth and I well Elizabeth gave a talk and I and I, I attended uh, in a memorial lecture for Hal Wilhite and Hal wrote some really nice work 20 years ago on just in case and and so Alan and I have been thinking about this as well so can we think about just what's just right as opposed to what's just in case? So just in case is this kind of storing up stuff in case we might need it in the in the future. And you know, and I, I so I think those are really quite interesting ideas. And and some of the stuff around resilience, I've been unfortunately for me caught in rooms with environmental scientists who talk about resilience, which I have a major problem with. And that because my problem with the concept of resilience is that it assumes forms of normality that and it's about trying to create ways to maintain that normality uh, and to build things up. So I've, all sorts of things are getting stored during COVID in the fear that the whole world's going to collapse and so on. So it's really a lot. That's a very long way of getting around saying what I think is really important about about this topic and, and particularly coming out of your talk, Stan, is, is the way in which different capacities and storage and not just the physical storage, but the way we think about storage holds in place forms arrangements of normality and so yeah I think I'll probably just stop there but that's what I think is really important yeah holding in place and yeah making maybe even reinforcing those normal normal patterns and services J James you've got your hand up but you're also next on my screen okay uh, so for those that don't know me I'm just finished a PhD in sort of information security but focused on smart grids uh, but my interest is risk and time at the moment. Uh, so these two talks kind of raised three points in my head. The one thing, like when you sort of said that the RFID system is Orwellian, it, it's not necessarily Orwellian, it's Taylorist. And when you view these systems through like the Taylorist scientific management of labor and supply lines, you then get very interesting questions about sort of agency when it comes to resilience. Uh, so one of the books that I'm reading at the moment uh, is called Reengineering Humanity by Frischman and Selinger. Uh, and it's all about exploring how these Taylorist systems sort of chip away at certain capacities we've had. So he is trying to kind of, the Doug character that you mentioned is trying to kind of abstract away our sort of appreciation of how we structure our storage giving it all over to these sort of like how you feature machine learning algorithms and getting the, the machine learning algorithms to then try and predict the future so it is removing the agency and thus the resiliency of our ability to make ad adaptive changes and have sort of the, the kind of the horizontal movements that we can have uh, if, if you're just streamlining into this very tailorist uh, just-in-time logic the, the 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 kind of the big second one for me was the sort of it was Greg's talk where it seemed to be sort of focusing on what network what sort of like adaptive networks that had appeared and built up in certain situations but hadn't analyzed how the sort of social relations of those communities had changed that kind of level of lateral movement. So there are famous historical examples of, it was the 1964 earthquake in, in Alaska, 
where the already existing sort of social orders and what the government had put in place in case of natural disaster just collapsed and the community just kind of came together organically uh, and how these sort of social relationships have changed. Uh, so I can't remember the contemporary person, but they were they were talking about how contemporary childcare, because we we don't let our children run free, uh, therefore that they have these deficiencies in exploration and risk taking. But sort of it, his analysis didn't look at the social order that you're right about childcare being a kind of a difficult thing to organize these days. But then there, there is the example in the book called Life and Death of the American City, where it's an ethnographic look at this one street. And what she notices with the childcare is that, that the parents let their children run free because they, they know that the entire street is sort of surveilling and observing the children in the street. And the case that she picks up on is like, a stranger who no one in the community knows appears and starts talking to the children. And within five minutes, the entire kind of community that is available and free turns up and interrogates the stranger. So there is this sort of gradual decline in the community social relations that this degradation has sort of okay. shrunk the amount of lateral movement we can have in our adaptation. And the final very kind of quick point that I wanted to add as far as the timing and the supply chain stuff is none of the analysis seems to have looked at like the ordering in the supply chain that yes that you can if you sort of shrink these storages down as much as possible it's going kind to of get the flow but it doesn't look at the complexity of item a may need to arrive and be assembled before item b can begin so there will be these still sort of pockets of storage just to kind of keep so yeah, uh, so those were the kind of the three things that the the two talks raised in me, uh, and if people want citations and want to uh, drop me out. Yeah, thanks, James. That last point was exactly what I was trying to say. Was like that's that storage. You, you know, you slim it down further down the line, but it has to get backed up. Kind of, there has to be capacity somewhere. Yeah. Um, Nicola, you're next on my screen. If that's okay. I um, would like to uh, um, stress a, a couple of points because basically. You addressed some aspect related to the possibility of measuring contingency, the relation between storage and the adaptability. But uh, I would like to point, point out uh, the relationship existing between storage and the information and the information networks. Because uh, uh, basically what uh, is happening is that uh, storage uh, is considered by organizations uh, as uh, a risk and uh, inefficiency. And uh, this is the trend uh, is that uh, we can uh, reduce uh, this uh, inefficiency and uh, risk by increasing integration uh, into information networks. And so uh, uh, th there is uh, uh, this, uh, this balance and, and trade off. The more we decrease uh, storage, the, the more we are supposed to become uh, efficient and uh, the more we uh, get uh, integrated uh, into the information network. But the point is that uh, with this kind of trend, risk uh, itself uh, changes because uh, if uh, previously we could still pretend uh, to uh, calculate uh, risk either by probabilities uh, or by some kind of deterministic uh, approach. And uh, in this way, we were objectifying risk. We were, were taking distance by, uh, from, from, from risk. With uh, integration uh, into information uh, networks, uh, we realized a kind of uh, delegation uh, process. And uh, we assume that uh, risk uh, is uh, somehow processed uh, through the information network. Uh, and so uh, somehow uh, we are assuming that uh, we can uh, exclude risk by including uh, risk uh, by processing it uh, within uh, the information network. It's a, a kind of uh, immune system. No? Uh, we want uh, to uh, neutralize a, a risk uh, by englobing in and by processing it through the information network. 
Uh, and so uh, uh, information network uh, and data do not uh, reduce uh, contingency. Uh, they are what are supposed to uh, uh, allow to be flexible. No, uh, because uh, uh, we enter in a kind of paradigm uh, where we are supposed to be able to continuously to, to adapt. Uh, this is uh, basically uh, how I, I see th this uh, relationship between uh, storage, uh, uh, information, uh, uh, risk and uh, uh, efficiency also. Really interesting. So in, 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 in some ways, the shift in the storage to the information networks making it faster is even more flex or, or su supposed to be even more flexible, even more. Yeah, also in this way, risks become uh, more uh, uh, undefinite, more uh, undeterminate. Uh, risk changes with uh, because we uh, lose the uh, capacity to predict, uh, to 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 predict and to and to calculate. But mm -hmm. uh, uh, and at, at the same time, uh, we introduce uh, uh, new sources of of risk. You no, know, because uh, uh, the functioning I tried to describe was uh, the functioning. In condition of normal functioning, you know, but uh, disruption uh, becomes uh, uh, more undeterminate, un undeterminate and uh, and uh, uh, more possible, I would say, because uh, we increase the intricacies uh, and the possibility in this way to create more disruptions uh, in, in the system. Thank you, Nicola. Jen, you're next on my screen. Hi. So I have a slightly random collection of thoughts. Um, I can't say that many of them actually relate to energy demand, but I'll speak on the kind of concepts of adaptation, resilience and storage. So my first bundle of thoughts was, does adaptation, resilience and storage, does it always relate to accumulating and storing up? Or does it ever actually relate to getting rid of things? So having to adapt by getting rid of things. Um, so for example, um, pubs getting rid of beer in their pumps and selling it at a cheaper rate. And that's one way of kind of keeping things afloat. As a household, like potentially like recently I've been clearing out some stuff. Gosh, what if we need to move soon because of X, Y, Z uncertainty? So does adaptation ever involve getting rid of stuff? The second kind of set of ideas that I had kind of came off the back of uh, Greg's presentation where he talked about um, working from home and obviously certain people don't have the ability to do that self-employed, uh, sorry, you know, changes in childcare and self-employed people and essential workers. And it just made me think about um, kind of social differentiation of resilience and contingency and that certain people and sectors and even scales and sizes of organisations have different choices available to them in terms of their ability to store or to respond to change. And so I guess my I've kind of in my mind shifted from thinking about organisations to the household. So Stan, I was quite <laughs> relieved when you went from kind of talking about the NHS to actually in the house, in homes, laundry baskets. And it just made me think about the differences between those scales. So, sorry, I, I can't remember your name. The chap that was speaking just before me talked about in organisations like storage is seen as risky and inefficient. Um, and actually those kind of moral undertones to um, storage and adaptation, because in the household, storing things, even dormant things that we don't use, it's kind of a morally responsible thing. So, oh, I should store them up just in case, you know, it'd be, it would be silly of me to get rid of them. So, yeah, just the kind of the moral undertones at various different levels in terms of how we go about responding to circumstances. So there we are. That was my random collection of thoughts. Thanks, Jen. I mean, it's interesting to come back to that just in case and just in time. And I guess you're right that those discourses about the kind of the stripping down and the, and the seamless, um, there's probably they're probably a bit conflicted as well in the NHS. So there are, I'm sure there are discourses about just in case as well. And similarly in the home. So you're right, sometimes getting rid of stuff just in case and just in time. They're quite neat. Uh, Marius, you're next on my screen. OK, thank you. Yeah, I just have a couple of thoughts as well. Um, first thing I was thinking uh, with Greg's presentation was that it was interesting how toilet paper uh, had such a low contingency, it seemed, or is it? Is it high contingency? Yeah. 
anyways, it had at least uh, it was very important for us as uh, as COVID entered, and um, and I, that was surprising to me. Definitely, there's some something more to learn about this topic. But what I've been thinking about, you've been talking about uh, risk connected to storage, and um, to me, I was thinking more about trust or lack of trust in a way, because. Um, if you if you're storing up a lot of things it shows that you are basically not really trusting that you'll be able to get those things i was thinking particularly about something i've been wanting to study for some time so if you have if you know about someone who's already studied it just let me know because i'm interested um but you know these doomsday preppers that are existing everywhere in the world i think that are basically storing up on a lot of things and of course people would say that that's not the most efficient way of of doing things particularly if when it comes to food, I think they're storing up things that are not really consumed at the end of everything. I mean, even the the government, I'm from Norway, I'm based in Norway, and uh, last year the government sent out a note to everyone saying that we should uh, try to keep at least three days worth of food in our houses and giving some advice just in case uh, there's a blackout and so on. So this issue of trust, I think, is related also to the to how we're used to having things available and I guess those who are uh, preppers they simply don't really <laughs> trust so there's I guess their contingency is also different so that could also be a different measure of contingency. Thanks Marius. Nick I've got you next. Thanks Dan and, and thanks okay. to Greg as well for the for his talk and actually to everybody else who's I've spoken out. The things that I want to say seem to change as uh, as, as we go through the list of, of other contributors. I think what it's made me think about is three um, dichotomies uh, that have been talked about. Well, two have been talked about, one's in my head. The two that have been talked about are between um, demand flexibility and storage. Um, and then there's been talk about a dichotomy between efficiency and resilience. And the one in my head is between goods and services. Dan, I mean, you talked a bit about demand flexibility and, and, and storage as, as as alternatives. And I think that's sort of known in the, the energy flexibility literature, particularly the electricity flexibility literature. I mean, Jakob obviously knows a lot about about that. And, the, and, and in economics, they're just seen as, as alternative ways of providing flexibility. But I mean, clearly the way that that flexibility is provided is pretty different. I, I wonder what the implications are for the efficiency versus um, resilience dichotomy. I mean, clearly the, the, the efficiency paradigm comes out of our physics and, and economics and applies to, you know, only really works in, if there's no uncertainty at all. Um, whereas resilience is much more important if you're thinking about uncertainty. And I thought that the last point that Marius made there about trust, you know, how much do different people trust the official view of what the future is or the, the extent to which the present is going to continue into the future. Uh, and that, I think, feeds back to your point, Stan, about, you know, really trying to understand hospitals really trying to understand the uncertainties that they face but presumably actually still face uncertainties as we found out in the last year that to some extent are irreducible but it did make me think about goods and, and services because i think storage is about storing stuff including possibly energy uh, it's difficult to see how you would store a service right so you can in a hospital, you can store a bandage, but you can't store nursing, right? So if you need nursing on a Thursday, you can't do a bit more nursing on a Wednesday. And you, you, so you can move the demand for it to the Wednesday, but you can't move the, the nursing, right? Whereas, so I just wondered if this is a helpful way to think about the relationship between demand, flexibility and, and storage is that they're actually trying to work on different bits of what we as as those who are energy researchers tend to think of differently as, as goods and services. So there's actually probably nothing useful there to anybody, but that's what I was thinking. I think the I think it's really useful to frame them as dichotomies between flex and storage, efficiency, resilience and goods and services. But I think there's also quite a few interesting questions about 
and they seem to be related, uh, as you're saying, Nick, but also how to understand the relationship between them as dichotomous mm -hmm. or not. So some way there. Thank you, Stan. Thank you, the, the presenters, yeah, and the, as well as the comments I really received. Well, uh, I guess the points I want you to raise have already been raised. I mean, I want you also to speak about the dichotomy between uh, efficiency and uh, resilience and contingency. I mean, but the point has already been very clearly made by Nick as well as uh, Nicola. Um, what I can add is just uh, maybe a reflection. I mean, a reflection related to the hospital, to the example you were bringing. I mean, say the just in time, and so hiring more data analysts, which is kind of okay of the logic of uh, you know the Cartesian narrative of prediction and control. So simply look at the pattern, look at the time series. But uh, I mean, again, uh, think about black swans. Think about and it's again connected to uncertainty. What if? Uh, and then for a scene event takes place and showed up at that precise point. I mean, and that, that goes back a bit, okay, to, I think there is a strong link with those images that Greg was showing of flooded areas. I mean, there were clearly black swans. And so, yeah, definitely that was the point I wanted to make. I mean, yeah, that, that okay, that clearly you want to implement just in time, get more efficient, but then when it comes to black swan, what you're going to do? Oh, Greg. You've got your hand up. Did you want to come back on something? Yeah, it's just a couple of points in the discussion. Just on black swans, I think pandemics were number one on the national risk risk register. So in a sense, it, it was at best a grey swan rather than a, a black swan. But maybe we didn't have the collective uh, imagination to think about what it might be. But um, just on the, on the discussion on what's storable and what isn't storable, I think that came through a lot in in our work. So I think that the non-storable things are things which you know, are time critical. So services definitely fall in, into that basket. You know, if it's if it's perishable, once that point in time's gone, that point in time can't be re rehad. Although I'm not quite sure that the it's as clear cut as um, services versus products, because you can you have a stock of services. So when everyone went to buying online with the COVID-19, there weren't enough delivery drivers. So what did they do? They recruited a load more delivery drivers and now we've got a much bigger stock of services, which is now in circulation, probably in perpetuity, because now we've got that stock of services and a different kind of system of provision. We're, you know, we're able to deal with larger volumes. So events like Black Friday are probably now less of a problem than they were three or four years ago when suddenly that was difficult to deal with. But I think I'd also want to bring back some of the discussion to this idea of, of, of expectations. And yeah. and that goes back to yeah. storage as well. So look, the amount of stuff that's in the NHS storage rooms that you were looking at is also partly a function of what kind of health service and system and expectations of healthcare we've decided to provide as our system of provision. And that drives in, in turn the number of consultants that we've got and once you've got those consultants they're going to find the number of operations that they're going to do and that's going to yeah. require a certain amount of stock and so on and so so i think this this notion of understanding the relationship with changing expectations is is really critical and and, and lots of people have kind of been pointing to that in in different ways so i thought it'd be useful yeah. to bring that back thanks greg i think that's really important that's i suppose that's also what i was trying to say with the linking joe and dale's washing baskets like the stock room or the stock system in some ways is kind of yeah a barometer of the kind of health system and the kind of services and the expected healthcare that you can so it's, it's a representation like it's come about you've got those stock systems and you can see you know and then you try to change them to just in time to meet that set of already established healthcare priorities and expectations in a way, it's like a dichotomous relationship, but also they're kind of impacting each other, like all the time. Anyway, sorry. I mean, I, just like what would your wash basket have looked like in 1913? Yeah. How many how many changes of clothes did you have? We've got a completely exactly. different expectation expectation on that. Yeah. I mean, I think the efficiency one is also a, a real challenge because that that talks to institutional boundaries. So it mm -hmm. might be inefficient for me specifically to stock those items in a in a room because of the space that it takes up. But it might be hugely inefficient from a system perspective to have a, a, a requirement that therefore stuff needs to be here on demand. I've just pushed the problem outside of my boundary and someone else's. So I find, yeah, I find the whole efficiency discussion quite, quite troubling in this space. Can I invite Miko next? Yeah, thanks, Stan. Well, this is thanks. a 
kind of point of the discussion that I think we have discussed quite little uh, prices and the market system as kind of bringing about some kind of stability. So, so obviously, uh, uh, supply and demand matches when somehow when the markets work, but then these blackouts or droughts or flooding or something, that's like something that the market does not handle at all, of course. So, so flexibility and resilience related to market supply and demand is another thing. And the kind of unexpected events is something quite different. And you prepare also for uh, to them in a different way. So thinking of the kind of market stability, then I, I guess it's quite important to notice that there's a lot of contracting over time. So different organizations commit to, to future deliveries, of course, and, and, and you, you have uh, delivery times and all of that. So we have a kind of whole architecture of, of kind of in-time contract. Then I'm thinking that the visibility of stocks uh, is something that we didn't discuss at all. So I, I'm thinking that particularly if you have kind of business actors, they are not willing to kind of expose uh, their inventories and so on and so forth. And yet this would be needed for some kind of an overview of how we should organize flexibility. Uh, so that's that's kind of a thing. And still for organizing flexibility, maybe the hospital example gave me kind of two thoughts. Firstly, I was thinking of some supply that is not based on market actors, like let's say blood donation. So we need a, a steady supply of blood donation and it's not something that you can buy. So there's a lot of kind of gifting type of a thing going on. Like for example, in Finland, there's, there would be a public uh, monitor of, of what blood types are low of supply and, and there's prompting of, of donators to go in and, and donate. And so, so this kind of a quite an other form of organizing supply is interesting and still kind of remaining in the hospital area, uh, I, I think that services can certainly be stored because there's like, we would have a six month store uh, queue for particular operations. And if there's some kind of a disruption in the supply of these services, the, the queue just, you know, extends. So, so the queue is kind of a buffer that operates as kind of like, a, it's not a kind of inventory of, of, you know, the service, but it's the opposite of that. It's kind of that how would I say demand is in, in stock or we have an inventory of demand when there is a queue. So queuing is one of these future or time related technologies. And finally, still, I'm, I'm quite interested in, uh, let's say that the hospitals have a low time in July. And of course, there's a lot of kind of capital investment going into hospitals. So the logic of somehow capital profit making would have a stable as possible uh, production process. So I'm, I'm thinking that there are then some other reasons that contribute to these peaks and, and it's some kind of like a, I, I guess here it's a negotiation between the capital owners and then the, the doctors or the, or the surgeons who, who want to have their holiday on in July or so peaks, are they some kind of a indication of a kind of a contrast in interests or, or something like that? Thank you very much. Miko, Elizabeth. Thanks. I'm still sort of struggling to work out what the topic is here. And all the talks are really interesting. So I get going and I get I get further along and get quite excited, including by the comments like Miko just talking about the market and Nicola talking about information. And the centre of the table seems to constantly move away. In other words, I can understand that all of these things are actually about the constitution of some version of normal. And I appreciate Nick's effort to try and bring some system to this discussion. I actually disagree with his dichotomies quite a lot, but I appreciate the kind of struggle that he's engaged in there. And so for me, and Stan said, is this a metaphor? Is this storage is standing for something else? And I think, I think maybe we're all standing for something else, but we don't quite know what it is and maybe there are just lots of different things implicitly behind the contributions and behind the questions that haven't quite come together yet. So I suppose I'm, you know, whether goods and services is that a similar or different kind of issue, it depends what the question is. And I don't know what the question is. So I'm still thinking about that. That's just a thought. Perhaps Jose. Well, um, I'm not very sure how. Uh, useful this might be, but all these 
talk about stock storage and systems of provision got me thinking about how there's certain disruptions that could create opportunities for uh, tighter integration of those systems of provision and therefore increase the flexibility of the system as a whole, but somehow they're being missed. And we saw a very clear example of that during the COVID lockdowns. And I'm thinking about the case of the shortage of certain products in supermarkets where the demand for things like soap or flour uh, skyrocketed in supermarkets, but at the same time it went to the bottom for the suppliers of things like restaurants and industries and things that were not seeing that much activity during those days. So that sort of inability of the system to you know reroute those chains of supply to different sectors of the system is creating this sort of artificial shortages of products because there are some some storage pockets in different parts of the system and somehow they're not being uh, seen and they're not taken into account to better redistribute the resources which could potentially be very helpful in, and reduce the, the stress put on to the system. Somehow they're not being even considered. So that was just what I was thinking about. So I come back to you, James. I was just going to say, I was just thinking about Elizabeth's comment about the centre of the table moving. And I was thinking, I don't know, but the when Greg brought the conversation back to expectation, or I know you kind of started us with that, I was thinking actually a lot of what we've been talking about has been the relationship between expectation as it's as it's made and the limits of adaptation so i suppose potential flexibility and i guess a lot of these things are circling for me well for me that's how what i was i've been that's how i've been framing some of the discussion J james so I, I was sort of a similar ilk um but sort of greg's bringing it back reminded me a lot of the debate about how capitalism changed our uh, kind of appreciation of time in the book, The Society of the Spectacle. So what he points out before you have sort of this very linear conceptualization of the future, we, we just base everything on like the cycle, either cycling of events or just event after event after event. But then capitalism sort of redefines the order of time and you have like this very linear sort of appreciation of we're, we're constantly going forward. So I, I feel that the answer to try and sort of broadly answer Elizabeth's question is for the system, whose imagination of the future are we on and how much lateral movement and sort of flexibility does that imagination of the future entail those within that system? Because if it's a very linear, we're just sort of focusing on profits, then yes, storage is an inefficiency that we need to get rid of but how that lack of storage then decreases the amount of lateral movement and agency we have if that vision of the future doesn't come to fruition thank you so much everyone thanks so much greg for um for the talk and the presentation the input uh, thanks everyone for your comments that's been really great